Um, yeah, let me please know if you can see my screen, first of all. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, today we're gonna discuss a um, very interesting topic for a lot of you. I hope so, at least. Uh, it's about microservices from bad to quality. We're gonna uh, discuss some common mistakes, um, uh, general questions about the architecture, uh, criteria, uh, some of the design mistakes that people usually make, the tech stack that uh, is uh, most, most frequently used. And then we're gonna have um, a look at the example of an improperly designed system uh, about it downsides we're going to discuss it and then we're going to have a look at the example of an improved and well-designed system we're going to see uh, what steps were taken to improve it how the final architecture looked like what challenges did the team face and some possible post improvements uh, meaning the things that could have been done better and beforehand i want to tell you that uh, if you have any questions or you think differently about something. Obviously, I do mistakes as we all do. Uh, notice everything that is wrong. Please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And uh, yeah, state your opinion. Okay, um, let's um, start with a quote as, as uh, the presentations uh, usually uh, do start. So the quote, uh, the quote is uh, from Robert Martin and it uh, says, gather together those things that change for the same reason and separate those things that change for different reasons. And that is uh, probably one of the uh, main ways to design microservice architecture uh, is to uh, separate those things that change for different reasons, right? Uh, okay, uh, so we have an intro question. Uh, can anyone elaborate why would we even use micro on a list? Uh, what could possibly be so important for us in that architecture that could make us go for a more complicated architecture than just a simple monolith? Who would be able to answer the question? Does anyone have any opinion? So you could have a big team with uh, ongoing development in parallel and you don't want uh, the different like sub teams not to step on each other's toes and interfere with each other. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That is that is a very good reason to go for microservices. Any other ones? Well, as an example, I'm working on a monolithic application and even the slightest change takes up to half an hour to deploy. So that's, as far as I think, can also be the advantage that microservices have over the monolithic applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is an is advantage. It, is it the possibility to scale some particular part of application, like one service, it could be a run, uh, for example, 10 instances in, instead of just one. And it also flexibility to um, share um, those services between different teams and possibility to use different languages, programming languages, I mean. Yeah, yeah, those are, those are very good points. Um, yeah, I think I think you've named uh, all of the advantages that I uh, was keeping in mind. So uh, let's move ahead. And yeah, in general, the microservice architecture is not always the best way to go. Uh, it is the best way for uh, certain cases. And uh, we've just named the reasons to go for it over the monolith. But yeah, uh, we always have to keep in mind that uh, it's not the right step all the time. So sometimes a monolith is uh, uh, much more reasonable uh, than microservices. Okay, um, now we're gonna talk about um, some of the criteria for, uh, for, uh, for a service, right? For a separate entity. And I'm gonna start with the first one uh, that I have, and then probably some of you could continue and add yours as well. So the first criteria for a service is that it should be small. So it should be implemented by a small team and it shouldn't take a long time to build. Uh, why is it so? Because uh, obviously uh, one of the reasons as we've already mentioned on a previous slide is that um, the speed of development uh, should be uh, higher uh, when using microservices than it is uh, with um, uh, monoliths. Uh, well, in some cases, obviously, but still. 
uh, it is it is one of the main reasons to go for microservices. So um, a service should definitely be small and easy to implement. Uh, does anyone uh, have any other criteria in mind right now? Do you mean like autonomous or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. It should be autonomous, definitely. Any other? Okay, the next one, it should be aligned among all other services. Uh, what does it mean? It should use, for example, uh, it should be aligned in the way it communicates with the, and, uh, with the rest of the system. So for example, if we have um, a cluster of services, uh, like a bunch of services that are communicating using a message bus, and then there is um, um, one more service that um, communicates synchronously over uh, direct, <coughs> apologies, over direct HTTP communication with the, with the rest of services, it doesn't align well. And that system would, wouldn't probably work well. I think there might be reasons to do so uh, in some cases. So yeah, we, we don't put any restrictions on the design, but uh, as a rule of thumb, it should always be aligned with the other services. Yeah, <clears throat> the other and probably, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's the main criteria, but uh, it's uh, definitely in the top three. It's, uh, it should be responsible for doing one thing very well. So when designing a service, you should always keep in mind, we should always keep in mind um, the single responsibility principle, meaning that um, the service boundaries should be very strict and they should be very uh, limited. I'm sorry. I... Yeah, apologies for that. My throat is uh, a bit sore today. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's hop in. Um, as already mentioned by one of you guys, I'm sorry, I did, didn't, know, didn't notice who it was. Uh, it should be autonomous and self-contained. And why it should be so? Because uh, obviously uh, you should be able to take out of the system at any point of the time. That you need, you should be able to change it to fix them any issues um, within the system. Uh, if, you, if you change the service, for example, if you change language or do whatever it is um, with it. Um, okay, does anyone else uh, uh, want to name any other criteria for the service? Okay. And let's, um, let's proceed. Um, well, now let's uh, discuss some common mistakes that people do when they design microservices. Uh, so I'll start with the first one and then probably you'll add, uh, add something here. So the first one is uh, not enough attention to the business domain knowledge, uh, meaning what? Uh, it means that when you design microservice architecture, you have to have um, a quite deep uh, knowledge in business domain. Uh, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to separate and um, separate and contain um, the uh, the uh, service boundaries. So when you design a service, it should be responsible for doing one thing properly, and it should do it very well. Uh, it should have a single responsibility, and there is no good way to find that single responsibility that should be put into a separate service without uh, good business domain knowledge, right? Um, does anyone know any other mistakes before we proceed to the other ones? Maybe you want to add something here? Maybe multiple services sharing a database, but that's more of a, a detail-oriented mistake, probably not a, a business-oriented mistake, but yeah. probably my opinion. Yeah, sure. Uh, so there, there are cases when um, sharing the database among services is applicable. Uh, but yeah, in, uh, as, a, as a rule of thumb, yeah, the services uh, should probably have uh, separate databases and only communicate with them directly. Okay, um, so another mistake is, is actually, it's, um, it's very good that you've mentioned this one is uh, blindly following the pattern. So I, I think we, 
most of us at least uh, have had uh, situations on our project when um, two people or a bunch of people were fighting over the implementation and one person goes, okay, we have to follow the pattern and the other ones go, okay, we can't do that because of that and that and that and that. And um, in general, it's always good to follow the pattern, but um, it's always good to take a step back and look at the things one more time. Uh, and um, in, in many situations, um, implementing the classical uh, pattern uh, wouldn't be applicable and it would actually wouldn't work well. So uh, for example, as, as we already mentioned, the um, uh, database distribution, in some cases, sharing a database would be um, um, a good step. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not very frequent. Um, the most frequent case is that, um, uh, is that services should have separate databases, but there are cases when, when it's applicable and it would actually work better than with uh, distributed uh, data model. The other uh, mistake is pattern frameworks, libraries, tools, overuse. Um, in my experience, I've seen a lot of cases when people found some great pattern framework, library tool, or whatever it is, and they go like, okay, I've read the uh, article uh, on, a, on some blog uh, from some cool guy that says, okay, this is the right next step, and they want to use it. Uh, they want to put everything in containers, they want to orchestrate everything with Kubernetes, uh, even though in their particular case, it doesn't work. So uh, again, it's always good to take a step back and uh, look at the things one, one more time and uh, evaluate whether it's worth it to use the technology or, or the stack or whatever it is, or whether it would be over engineering. So people, a lot of times people over engineer when they work with uh, microservice architecture. The, the other common mistake is making services too small. Uh, so as we know, making services too big is a, is a, is a very bad mistake because uh, you don't follow the single, single responsibility uh, principle in that case. And then your system becomes more tightly coupled and then it's hard to fix things, it's hard to replace things, it's hard to uh, track the errors, it's hard to debug it. Uh, it, it. Yeah, you just make your life uh, a bit harder at that point. But making services too small is another mistake that people uh, often make. Uh, and what does it lead to? It leads, for example, to an increased uh, latency, uh, to increased network traffic. So for example, there are um, cases um, very often when it's more reasonable to have uh, 10 bigger services than 20 smaller, for example, because it would uh, decrease latency and overall processing time for a few times at least, right? Um, another is uh, tight service coupling. Um, that is an obvious one. Uh, services should be um, isolated. Uh, they should work well, with themselves. They should cooperate with the entire system, obviously but they should uh, also be very independent uh, and loosely coupled to the rest of the system. Um, yeah, uh, another, and, and that is actually a very big one. It's implementing cross-cutting functions uh, as a last step. That includes uh, things such as logging, authentication, caching, user management, or other related things. So those are secondary functions for the system, for the business, right? But they are very important to implement at at the same stage when um, the service is being implemented. And uh, from my experience, my personal experience, I can tell you that, that this is a very, um, very big mistake and, it's, uh, and it affects the development uh, very much because if you face uh, uh, that thing at the last step, if you start implementing it as a last step, then you start noticing that, okay, this could have been done um, another way and that service could have been done another way and that logging doesn't work well now with our data distribution um, process and then it doesn't work well with that and that and that and that. Okay, if you keep in mind uh, those things um, while implementing the services themselves, then you're not gonna re-implement a lot of things um, in the future, right? As the last step, uh, otherwise it's gonna increase development costs, it's gonna increase complexity, it's gonna increase, um, maintenance cost, it's going to increase everything. Another common mistake is uh, expanding service boundaries. And um, what does it mean? It means uh, making services bigger. Uh, 
along with new requirements. So it's it's a very frequent thing when new requirements uh, show up or uh, there is not enough uh, functionality to uh, put it in a separate service, um, but still you need that functionality in the system. People always tend to go for, okay, now this, this is very similar to what that service is doing. So I'm going to put it there. And then in the future, we're going to see what happens. Uh, and if, and if it starts growing, I'll just, I'm just going to separate it and split it and put it in a separate service. But most of the time it doesn't work. And um, yeah, you just um, end up, um, blowing up services, uh, they become too big, too tightly coupled, and the system starts, yeah, going going down or whatever it is. Yeah, you just start facing issues all the time. And the last but not the least is um, um, that when logging is not centralized. Um, okay, there are cases when it's better to do the logging separately for each service or for, for a cluster of services uh, or any, any other way, there are cases. So we are not putting any restrictions in the design here, but um, in general, uh, not centralized logging is going to lead to, uh, to a mess. Uh, because if you, have, if you have it distributed and the data from those logs is uh, related, uh, then it's going to be a mess um, at, at some point because it, the, the amount of data is going to grow the relation is going to be even harder to find. So if, as a, as a rule of thumb, if the data from the logs is not related to each other, so if, um, if the services do not share the logging data in any way, then it's okay to do it um, um, not centralized. It, it's, it's okay to do it uh, separately. But uh, if the data is related, even in the slightest way, it's always better to do the centralized logging for example, by using the logging service or any other uh, approach to that. Okay, uh, at this point, we're, we're gonna have a look at uh, some of the two not so common mistakes, but very crucial mistakes. And the first one, um, and you're gonna see soon why we are discussing it. Uh, the first one is bad communication model amongst services. So if you obviously pick a bad communication model uh, among services is gonna, uh, lead to issues. So for example, you pick um, um, direct HTTP, uh, direct communication over HTTPS or sockets or whatever it is over the message bus, even though in that particular case, the message bus would work better or um, vice versa, right? Then yeah, it's gonna lead to a lot of issues. And the other one is bad data distribution process. As we've already discussed, um, um, for example, it's, um, it's um, um, having uh, one centralized database or data warehouse uh, on one hand and having it uh, distributed and split it uh, amongst all the services on so it's always good to uh, take a look at things one more time and pick the right model for your particular situation and um, yeah because sometimes sometimes it works better one way and sometimes it works better the other way um, during that process, did anyone come up with any other mistakes? Maybe that you've faced um, in your personal experience or, or you've seen over the years or you just want to state it? Okay, good. <clears throat> um, let's, let's then proceed to our uh, example. So now we're gonna have a look at the example of the system. Uh, it's a real world example. Um, and um, that system was initially designed by, um, by a team, um, by a small team, uh, re relatively small team of five developers. And they designed it uh, very poorly. And it has led to a lot of, um, a lot of issues, a lot of problems uh, for the business, um, a lot of um, money spent on redesigning and redevelopment. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna have a look at it and discuss what, what is wrong about it. But first let's um, discuss in general, what did the system do and what was it for? <clears throat> what was the business value of the system? So the system was created to, for file processing. I cannot unfortunately disclose the uh, concrete operations uh, that it performed, but uh, it was the system that, um, that was accepting um, data files and doing manipulations with them. Uh, different services uh, did different things. Uh, so one service did uh, 
uh, some specific operation on the file and then it passed the file to the other service that was required and then so on and so on using that chain and then the user got uh, a result of them as a modified file okay uh, the second thing, it was virus scanning. So the system uh, was using um, third parties to scan uh, files for viruses. Uh, and the third one was metadata editing and elimination. So the system also worked with uh, files metadata and uh, uh, it was used to edit the metadata and el eliminate it if that was required. Um, now let's talk. Um, okay, maybe, maybe you have any questions at this point? Okay, um, then let's uh, have a look at system composition. And then after that, we're gonna uh, have a look at the, um, at the graphic. Okay, uh, what did the system consist of initially? So it was a gateway service for request routing. And the first mistake here, it was, it contained identity processing and it also contained payments. So it had three responsibilities. So one service had three responsibilities, routing, identity, processing, and payments. And that is the first mistake. The, the other uh, item in this system was uh, file operation services. So there were, I think it was four or five uh, services that were responsible for, uh, each was responsible for, uh, for a specific operation on the file. Uh, so these were there. And then there was a shared SQL data warehouse. Okay, let's have a look now at, uh, at the system. So as we've discussed, um, there is the gateway service that included some, uh, security and identity processing, and it included payments as well. And there are operation services and they were all hosted in Azure. Uh, they were all hosted separately in Azure app services, and they were communicating directly over HTTPS. And they were all connecting to the same data warehouse, to the same SQL data warehouse. And the other thing was that they were throwing files. So the way they communicated, they were throwing files over the network to each other over HTTPS. So let's, let's discuss uh, this design a little bit. So can anyone tell uh, what, it, what is wrong about it? What bottlenecks um, uh, do we face and what issues does it lead to? I mean, when you mentioned those previous responsibilities, the first point seemed like one service was, well, one part of the architecture was responsible for multiple things. Well, uh, well the second option basically uh, implied, at least to me, that what, what could have been one service turned into many nan nano services, basically. So the bottleneck probably, if I were to maybe guess or thing that I have an educated opinion on would probably be the gateway service at first. Mm -hmm. But I cannot claim that I know the answer. Sorry. Yeah, it, it would definitely make sense to uh, split it and um, have separate identity service and separate payment service. So that is, um, that is a very good point indeed. Um, any, any other? Maybe we have to use some message broker here instead of HTTP. Yeah, um, okay. And <clears throat> why, why would we do that here? So what would be the reason for mm -hmm. doing so? Because if some uh, request to some service will fail, uh, it will fail an entire application. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, what about what about the files? What um... they probably shouldn't be sent from one service to another. Should be saved some somewhere from probably in storage, something like that. And also, this files processing is, uh, as for me, is it, it is more likely pipes and filters. Um, can you elaborate on the last point? What do you mean uh, by pipes and filters? Uh... Well, um, maybe it is possible to not to use microservices in this part. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. It is classical file processing tools of when a first service processes files and then th send it to, um, to other, right? And we can use mm -hmm. pipes and, uh, well, microservices kind of filters and here should be some kind of router 
etc etc and this is pipes and filters architecture not microservices at all mm -hmm. yeah that's that's actually that is a very good point but um um in in this particular case okay if i was able to disclose the the process entirely then um yeah we would probably agree that it was worth uh, using the microservice architecture here but that that's a that's a very good point but um for the for the sake um of uh, of the presentation let's um yeah stick to the microservices and um yeah let's keep in mind that the system requirements uh, were actually um designed in a way that it was uh, the best to use uh, microservice architecture but um but yeah but that is this is a very good point um okay and um <clears throat> what what bottlenecks um could we possibly face, for example, with the files, and uh, specifically, what what could be wrong if the if the file was too big? Is it the network bandwidth? Uh, can you repeat, please? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it the network bandwidth? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the network bandwidth, um, then the latency, and then, well, let's what what would be what would happen, for example, if um, the file processing uh, procedure would take, um, I don't know, maybe five minutes or something, and the file was 100 megabytes. What, what would happen with the response to the client in this case when, when the services uh, communicate this way? Well, at least in the, in the project that I'm working on, we usually get the timeout. Uh, yeah, that's, that's correct. And the, the bad thing about this timeout is that um, even though there would be a timeout for the client, the services would still be doing the work, right? Because they wouldn't know about it. So that's, um, that's um, yeah, just using processing power um, for nothing, right? Uh, okay, and what about, what about the logging? Does, uh, does anyone see any logging issues here as well? Is there logging here? Yeah. regarding well, those diagram looks like no logging at all <laughs> yeah yeah there wasn't any logging initially uh and there was um there was another uh there was another flaw but let's imagine that there is logging here okay and um that every service does the logging by itself there is no centralized logging so what issues could it lead to relation id is missing so we don't know, um, oh, it's for future when we split to uh, microservices, we need correlation ID to know what, ex mm -hmm. uh, what exact uh, pass uh, for some particular request, file processing uh, item happened. Um, probably we need also centralized uh, login because um, anything could happen for any service. Mm -hmm. And uh, also probably what is missing is uh, uh, maybe some storing, um, uh, I forgot this word, <laughs> MD5, uh, SHA1 or others uh, hashing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to hash a file maybe because we can process the same file multiple times. So instead of processing, same file multiple times, we can do it only once and just return the result. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. very good point. Okay, and what about the deployment and the hosting costs and things like that? I mean, is it efficiently to, um, to have uh, separate um, Azure app services and and scale them in any way. Well, how do, how would that look like in that case? Uh, in I, case? I'm not sure about current diagram. Does it mean that operation one service operation three operation two service is a different services or it's a just a copy? Yeah, it's a it's different services. Those are separate services. Mm -hmm. You would have a problem with scaling individual services because like. You, you would basically need something like a log balancer between each two services, like in front of each individual service. Right, right. That is that is correct. That's a very good point. Okay, so I think we've we found more than enough issues in in this uh, system. 
let's have a look at some other downside uh, of it. Uh, the first one is obviously bad performance because uh, uh, communicating over HTTP and throwing files over the network uh, that way is very inefficient. And as I've already mentioned, if, if the file is too big, uh, yeah, it's gonna be a message, it's gonna give timeouts and uh, then it's very network speed dependent. So the moment your network speed goes down, um, yeah, it makes your entire system go down. So it's very dependent on the network connection, which is not very good. Uh, the second one is uh, expensive hosting uh, because of the, uh, as, as, it was, as it was already mentioned, uh, because um, of the uh, scaling. So when you do uh, uh, horizontal scaling, it would obviously be very expensive to host those. And the other point that was mentioned is there is no load balancing at all. Uh, and it's uh, also a very complex and inefficient CI/CD because you have to uh, deploy everything separately, even though that's a good option, but you always have to have like many options, you have to have options to deploy uh, and host everything uh, as a whole, or you, uh, and also you need to have a possibility to do it separately. So that is the best way here. You don't have the first option, you only can do it separately, which is, um, which is not very good. Poor scalability, as was already mentioned. Um, the other one is if one service fails, everything fails because it doesn't return the result simply. And because of the, uh, the way the logging was organized, um, eventually in that system, uh, you wouldn't even find wh where it failed uh, properly. Uh, if, if a server stops working, yeah, request cannot be handled. Okay. Um, now let's talk about possible solutions. What could be done to make it better? Um, yeah, and I'll start with the first one and then you'll probably continue. So the first one would be to use containers and orchestrator instead of separate apps. This would uh, give us two things. The first uh, would be scalability. It would be much more scalable and easy to do so. And the second one, it would, be, it would give us um, an option to make the deployment process uh, better and more efficient. Okay, what, what, what would be the other things? Um, there was already a mention of a message bus. Any other? I think we should uh, well consider not sending files over uh, HTTP if this is possible. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So um, I don't think I've added it here. I think I forgot to at this point. But yeah, that is um, um, that is um, that is a very good point. So instead of uh, throwing files around over over the network, it, the best way would be to uh, initially <clears throat> apologies initially save the file to some storage uh, in the cloud and then uh, download and upload it with uh, each individual service, right? That would be the best way to do that because it would reduce uh, the traffic uh, and it would make the system uh, much less uh, reliable on the network. And then it would also make it um, more failure resistance because we could, um, um, we could save uh, the file resave it at some point, uh, at a point when a specific service stopped working on it, and then we could get back to it, uh, and then we could do something with it later. For example, in a, in a case when when the next service in a chain of responsibility has failed or it uh, stopped working or any other thing has happened. Um, yeah, the other thing is, uh, and, it, and, it's, uh, and it's done uh, by the message bus is implement request retry pattern or a circuit breaker if the system requires it. So in order to uh, make it uh, failure resistance uh, and when one part of the system fails, uh, we need to have a mechanism to, uh, to retry uh, that process and uh, yeah, and finish finish the request and send the response to the client eventually. Uh, in a system that is designed like the one that we've just have had a look at, uh, it wouldn't work like that. Uh, it just wouldn't work well. Um, yeah, and it's it's not even possible. Uh, yeah, and introduce proper gateway service and intranet, meaning that, um, for example, in this case, 
uh, even though you can put uh, restriction to the Azure app services, but it requires additional action, uh, additional actions. Um, by default, all those services, all those app services, they were uh, available to the outer world, to the network, and you could access them and send some requests to them, which is not very good because, um, yeah, for the microservice architecture, all the communication should happen through the gateway as a rule of thumb. Um, Okay, the, the other one is uh, split the database because obviously in this case, it doesn't make sense to have, um, to have a common database because the services, um, as we've discussed, they, um, they don't share the data very frequently in a way when it should be uh, merged into a single database. Um, the next point is to split services properly and it's um, related to the gateway point when um, the gateway service or any other service has more than one responsibility, it makes sense to split those services and uh, put those responsibilities into uh, separate entities. Okay, um, so how did we, how did we start uh, improving it? Uh, so the, the, the project that, um, that the team has got was designed in a, in a very poor way. So the team had to do something with it. So what were the, um, the approach, what was the approach for, for a good design. So the first one uh, was to reveal uh, the weaknesses, what weaknesses does the system have, uh, how they can, how can they be eliminated and we did the uh, similar process as to what we uh, were doing just now. Uh, and we defined what were the weaknesses and how can they be eliminated, transformed, change, uh, et cetera. Uh, the, the next step was the transformation itself. We created SRS and SDD and the uh, testing, all the testing documents, and we redesigned the system and thought of the future, uh, how it will work, how we would scale it, and what should we use, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the next thing that we did was uh, split the work among the teams to deliver the fastest results possible. So we split the work. Um, um, among, among the teams, whatever. Yeah, it just, um, there is no additional explanation to this one. And then um, the, the other thing that we did, and, it, and this is actually very important in microservice architecture, is when the system is already working well, um, it, it is always good to think uh, of ways to improve it and make it even better because uh, the sky is the limit, as we know. And if you have time, if you have opportunity, if you have the budget to do so, it is always good to do, to do it. Yeah, and to optimize it. Now, um, yeah, let's 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 have a look at the improved design. Um, yeah, I'm probably not the best at creating uh, those uh, charts, so I don't think the all of the information uh, would be um, very clear on this. So, if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt me and ask them. Uh, I'll just describe describe it generally. So what we did is we um, split the services properly. So we, the first um, step that we did was we uh, created a separate identity service, separate payment service, uh, and separate logging service. We made the logging uh, completely centralized and we actually used a non-SQL database uh, for, for, the, uh, for most of the logging. And why, why did we do that? Because, um, um, the system was quite high low and the traffic for the uh, logging service and the amount of information coming in was quite high. So when we tried to use the relational database, the SQL database, um, it, yeah, it started showing signs of poor performance. So we decided to go with non-SQL and it improved the, um, the performance um, quite significantly. Um, yeah. And, we used uh, Ocelot for gateway service. The other thing that was bad for uh, in, in a previous, okay, it wasn't bad, uh, it is a way to go, but for our particular case, it, was, um, it wasn't worth the time spending on it. Uh, those guys designed gateway service um, by themselves and all of the redirection, all, all of the routing was done uh, by their code. And sometimes it was inefficient and it was uh, throwing files as well improperly. So we decided to re-implement uh, the entire thing. And um, what gateway service did uh, as a first step was um, it was um, 
um, routing the requests using Ocelot. And it was also saving the files to Azure blobs. So the file coming in was saved to Azure blobs. And then there was a message sent to uh, the message bus stating that the file was uploaded uh, with uh, these parameters. So the first service um, is whatever operation to service that has to uh, do this and that and that and that with that file. Uh, and yeah, and then there was also information about the chain of responsibility uh, processing. So there was information about the chain of, um, of the services that should do some operation in that file. And then when each uh, service um, finished uh, working on the file, it uh, uploaded back over overwrite it uh, on the Azure blob storage and then put another message to, um, to the queue stating that uh, the next uh, service from, from the chain can pick it up uh, at that address, uh, download it and process it. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, and as you can see, we've also separated uh, the SQL database uh, for identity and payment service. And we decided to make it common for identity and payment service because um, they were quite tightly coupled. Um, I, I don't know if it was the best way. We were thinking a lot about it, whether to make it, uh, whether, whether to split it or merge it. And we decided to go with the merge option just to make um, our lives a bit easier. Um, yeah. so. Someone could argue that, and yeah, that is fine. And we also hosted everything in, in Docker and used Azure Container Service uh, as an orchestrator. So the scaling became very easy and, uh, yeah, and efficient. Um, do you have any questions or maybe some points um, that you would have done differently? Maybe you would have implemented something differently and yeah. That is, that is fine to state it if you have uh, points like that. Uh, I would like simply to ask, when you mentioned mm -hmm. the chain of responsibility, um, did you mean that there was some orchestration happening or that each uh, operation service had the knowledge of what is going, what's, what the next uh, operation service, uh, what, what next operation service should process the document? So mm -hmm. how exactly? Yeah, um, so the, the way, thank you for the question. The, the way it was happening is um, that initial request uh, contained the parameters, uh, which stated what operations uh, should be performed on the file. And then using those parameters, uh, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the, the gateway, the, each, each of the service um, using those parameters, each of the service um, pushed uh, the message to Azure queue stating which of the next uh, services should pick it up and process the file. So for example, if, if um, there was operation two, three, uh, and four, uh, okay, there, there are not all of the services here uh, just to save the space. If the, uh, if the request stated that there should be operation two, three, and four performed on the file, then the gateway service uh, uh, stated that um, in the message that uh, the service two should pick it up and the uh, service two was subscribed obviously to that and uh, it picked it up uh, first and then it did the same thing for the other uh, services in the chain. So that's how it happened. Okay, so the client application send the request with the order which the document yeah. should. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you. it uh, it um, it didn't send the order. It just uh, sent uh, the um, the um, yeah yeah okay yeah it sent the order. So whatever order was in the request, uh, that was the order the operations were performed uh, at. Because it um, it actually didn't matter the order didn't matter because it wouldn't affect the um, the time of the response in any way because uh, each of those services had to uh, had to uh, perform operations uh, separately uh, anyway and uh, it took the same time uh, any order you put it oh okay okay got it thank you thank you for your question um, any other questions or points here I have a sort of small question about price 
um, what, what price it was for um, a low load. I mean, when uh, not, an, not many files are processed during, let's imagine, day or mm -hmm. week. Um, uh, can you please specify? Um... Uh, I, I'm asking because I try to convince uh, my client to use uh, microservices and a Docker to switch from virtual machines, but uh, looks like uh, it's hard to measure how much it will cost. Um, it, it depends on a lot of factors. Well. Uh... By default, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's think... obviously because when uh, you, you should pay for um, sort of each container use, right? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Um, uh, that's why I'm asking when you have uh, high pressure, you, for example, have five instances of uh, number one service. Mm -hmm. But if you have no um pressure at all uh, that uh, you're using just one but even those one should be redundant for some days for example mm -hmm. you mentioned that it could be um, service number one and number four so two and three could be even offline yeah yeah if they're if they're not required you can put them idle Mm -hmm. So um, I'll try to answer your question as specifically as I can, but yeah, it's it's better to know the situation completely to do so. But uh, in general, the virtual machines in Azure specifically, uh, to my knowledge, they are um, much more expensive to maintain than this kind of infrastructure, um, simply because um, yeah, the virtual machine cost uh, is is pretty high. And it's always working, so it's always on. It's whether off or it's on. So and it's and it's true for the entire system. So you just cannot uh, put it idle partially. You have to keep it on, or you have to keep it off. And yeah, yeah, it's obvious. But um, I know that it's and, uh, too special for my case. Uh, maybe you can you measure you can name uh, the difference in price. What it could be. Because for now, it seems that it's not super useful for us to switch to containers. It uh, would be quite exp expensive to change all our configurations to support this new structure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it also depends on the plan uh, that you go in Azure. There are different plans for container hosting, for example, and uh, which have um, um, different processing power. So if mm -hmm. you go for the cheapest one, uh, I think it wouldn't be too expensive. I'm not ready to um, name the specific numbers because uh, I've worked with that infrastructure. I think it, it was probably five years ago or something like that. So oh, okay. I think the price has changed. Uh, it's it's more that. like if you had a similar experience, you can uh, say, for, yeah. uh, for example, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a way cheaper. It, you should do it. It will be much cheaper, for example, two times at least. Mm -hmm. Because think, for um, now it seems that uh, they are quite similar prices. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. Um, I mean, what, what you could do is just uh, a small testing. I think you could um, uh, persuade your client to um, to do like a pet project or something, mm -hmm. and just create a few services and put it in in Docker. Yeah, contain, containerize it and then host it in Azure. And then put put some uh, yeah create some uh, automated testing. So for example, a script uh, that would you would put um, I don't know in in a scheduler or a, or a web job or or I don't know Azure function whatever it is. Uh, yeah, you you just create it and then you set the frequency and the size of the request and then you just uh, yeah throw request to the system. Uh, you increase it, decrease it, and then you just yeah you just uh, track the the cost that are being taken off of your account. Another option to do this may be to route a real request to your uh, test infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. Or you can, oh, by the way, I would also consider to you uh, to look into serverless, maybe Azure Functions, something like this. Yeah, that's uh, that's another good option. In my particular case, Azure Functions didn't, won't help, definitely. 
Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, but um, I, I think that is the only, um, those are the only ways for you to go because it's, uh, yeah. It's yeah, I know that is the best way to measure on my own just to see how much it will cost. But I, I was asking, maybe you have similar experience. If no, it's, it's no. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, okay. thank you. Thank you for your question. Does anyone else have any questions or things to say? Yeah, you. I have only one question. You mentioned before that uh, all of the requests uh, now uh, are logged somewhere to store the information about correlation ID and something like this. So, yep. uh, but if we store all of the requests, it will, uh, the database size will increase uh, in the short time. So uh, did you do some like cleanup of the database after some period or? Or do you still use all of the requests like to, to, to be stored in the database? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, so we used um, uh, a month uh, of, of the data. So every month we had a job uh, in, in, a, in a Azure Web Jobs that uh, sent the request to logging service uh, once a month to clear up uh, all of the data that is older than one month. And it was uh, stated for the clients that uh, we keep data for one month. Yeah. Okay, thank you. What about identity server uh, service? Uh, what specific services uh, providers have you been used? Yeah, we used uh, identity ser server for, for that. So it was uh, open ID. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, I have one question uh, addition. Uh, regarding to uh, message bus, did you use Rabbit? Uh, we, we've used Azure Q. Azure Q. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, let's um, move on and um, see what challenges have we faced. Uh, so the first one was a huge CPU and memory load in some operation services. So the operations uh, that were performed on the file, some of them were very heavy. So uh, for example, I can, I can probably name one. It was uh, merging large files. So you had um, like a 10 files or something like PDFs or uh, whatever they were. And then you had to uh, sequently uh, merge them in a particular order into one big file. And that operation, it was a very, uh, it was a great load on, on the memory and on CPU <clears throat> because uh, files could be like 50 megs or something like that. So we faced uh, that. So we had to perform, uh, perform these in parallel. So what we came up with is, for example, if you have 10 files that should be merged, we merged uh, in parallel the first two files. So we split them into chunks of two files. And we split two files and then the other two and the, uh, the other two in parallel. And then at the end, we, we did the same thing recursively. So that was probably the fastest way. So we've had um, kind of a uh, parallel processing and uh, a bit of concurrency as well uh, on that side. Uh, the other one was uh, that uh, testing was hard because obviously testing with files and high load systems, uh, it's always hard and it was um, quite hard to measure anything manually. Um, the third uh, was the, the Docker documentation was quite poor at that time because it was a few years ago and Docker, they are known for not keeping their documentation up to date all the time. And yeah, and it was, and it wasn't uh, complete uh, as well uh, to everything that we needed. Um, the other was manpower limitation. The team was uh, quite small and the system was um, quite complicated and we only had five people to work on it. Uh, so we faced that uh, and it was, um, um, quite hard to, uh, yeah, to, to split the work, uh, especially, and uh, decide who's going to work on what, and set the priorities, because if you have um, uh, a few services, you have to prioritize which one of them you're going to implement first, 
and uh, yeah, and things like that. So it was um, uh, a bit of a struggle to do that. And uh, poor DB performance that I've already mentioned, we've had a relational database for uh, for the logging service, and it led to um, to poor DB performance. So what we did. Um, uh, some services, so uh, the the uh, in general, uh, all of the services, and that is that is one of the reasons why I told initially that um, uh, we we um, we've gone for uh, for the microservice architecture instead of uh, instead of the pipeline is because some of the services were, for example, uh, implemented in Go language because uh, it provides uh, great uh, parallel parallel processing and it's very fast and. Uh, as well built in uh, and uh, well-performed concurrency. Uh, so that was one of the reasons. It wasn't the main reason and not the only one, but that was uh, one of the most important reasons to go for it as well. Um, and, um, and yeah, and it, uh, and it actually gave a great boost in performance uh, when we re-implemented uh, some, uh, some of the algorithms and services in Go. Uh, then we introduced automated testing. Um, uh, so how did it look like? We didn't have uh, automation engineers, so we had to come up with, uh, yeah, with with some custom solutions that uh, people do when they have uh, haven't ever worked with uh, automated testing frameworks or anything like that. So what we came up with, we created a job, a scheduled job that was um, um, downloading. Uh, it was a small console application that was uh, sending uh, a lot of requests. I think it was um, probably a few thousand requests over a few minutes um, um, to process the files. And we had a separate uh, folder in, um, uh, uh, in, a, in Azure Blob uh, storage uh, that contained testing files. They were of various sizes and uh, various uh, formats and uh, uh, various uh, contained various things. And then the the system downloaded them, processed it, and uh, uh, logged uh, all of the information uh, on uh, which operations uh, have gone well, which operations failed, at what point, etc. And then we sent an email to all the participants of the process with the information uh, of the with the results of the testing, and then we could instantly see whether anything was wrong in the system, and the tests were running every four hours. Uh, yeah, and uh, another solution that I've already mentioned is we used NonSQL uh, for the most highly loaded part, and uh, it gave a great boost uh, for us. And um, what, what could have been done better? Um, uh, some things that uh, could have been done differently. Uh, well, the first one, uh, some service boundaries were not defined properly. So, and that's why I mentioned that it is very important to know uh, the business domain very well, because if you, if you deeply know how the business works and what it should deliver and for who it should deliver, then you are, uh, you can be pretty sure that you will set uh, great service boundaries and you're not going to expand them. Uh, it's not going to be a pain uh, in, uh, later in the process. Uh, and the second thing that payment DB could have been separated, uh, so the payment service could have had um, a separate DB, but we didn't go for it. Um, maybe we could have done that, but yeah, that's that's going to uh, to be a mystery. Uh, now, <laughs> so those are some some of the things that could have been done better. Uh, and you've also mentioned uh, your points as well. Um, and. That's it for me for today. So if anyone else has any other questions or any other points to discuss, please uh, feel free to ask.